Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. The worst part about insomnia is the boredom. Nothing open except for the seedy places. Nobody awake except for the seedy people. Nothing to do except watch movies and eat sunflower seeds. Seriously, fuck insomnia. My sleep capacity generally comes and goes in waves, but the few weeks before I found Hal's were especially rough. There was no inciting incident, just that general feeling of restlessness and anxiety that has become a familiar friend over the years. I tried all of the standard assists, warm milk, old movies, cut down on my caffeine intake, all the usual things that people recommend, but never work. Eventually, more out of boredom than anything else, I took to taking late night walks through the city. I worked a shitty job as a projectionist at a local movie theater, and on the weekends, I didn't often get off work until the last movie finished, and the city had long since wound down by the time I was free. The first week or two, I stayed towards the well-lit areas populated by the intoxicated, both rich and poor. But while the people watching was always good, I quickly grew tired of the relentless noise and began wandering off the beaten path. I'm not sure how I'd never noticed Hal's before. I distinctly remembered buying smokes at the dilapidated gas station across the street on several occasions, and I'm sure my eyes would have been drawn to the large storefront windows still brightly lit and welcoming at 3 a.m. The neon sign pronouncing it Hal's low-cost thrift and consignment glowed in garishly conflicting colors, except for the first S which was burnt out. Of course, I would come to realize that there were very good reasons I had never seen it before, but that first night I wondered if maybe I was hallucinating from sleep deprivation. I entered, of course, even if I didn't feel the need to validate that the whole thing wasn't just a figment of my imagination, there was no way I was denying my curiosity. It was probably the smell that I noticed first, kind of a combination of burning sage and rancid meat, but in a weirdly good kind of way. Best thing I can compare it to is a beach bonfire at low tide. The place was packed full of merchandise, all displayed very neatly on row after row of shelving, but without any sign of clear organization. Knickknacks sat on the same shelves as old magazines and jumper cables. A bizarre collection of artwork decorated the walls, from shadow boxes holding sports paraphernalia, to Pink Floyd posters, to copies of famous Impressionist paintings. The wall furthest from the front entrance was actually just an unbroken line of doors. Each door was crafted in an entirely different style, and each painted a different color to create a full-length pride flag along the wall. In the center, the green door actually appeared to be an elevator, which really just raised additional questions. I began to browse the first aisle to the left of the front door. A full silver-plated dining set, a clown costume, a chainsaw without a chain, four cookbooks, a Super Soaker XP100 already filled with water, several fake antique-looking religious relics such as crosses and Buddha heads, and a full-length evening cloak that made me immediately start contemplating a career as a supervillain if for no other reason than I would look amazing in it. I browsed several more aisles with a bemused smile on my face, as the truly eclectic inventory continued to defy any clear organizational sense, until a gruff voice cleared its throat. I glanced up to see the shopkeeper behind the front counter staring at me. He was a medium-sized man but held a clear, don't fuck with me aura around him. His head was shaved bald, and his arms and shoulders indicated someone who had spent more than a few years working in trades. Can I help you find something? He asked, his voice a low grumble that ran the line between professionalism and wanting to throw your ass to the curb. I shot him one of my patented disarming smiles. Not really, I'm just browsing. He continued to stare for a moment, his eyes probing as if searching for a way to sort me into one of the Jungian archetypes that all retail employees have for their customers. Incubus? He asked finally. Excuse me. Are you an incubus? He responded, his eyes still searching mine. No Gemini, actually. Well, on the cusp with cancer, really. I didn't think people actually use the astrology pickup in real life. I gotta ask, do you get a lot of success with that one? With nostalgia being all the rage these days, going for one of the classic pickup lines is actually a brilliant idea. The corner of the man's mouth twitched just for a moment before returning to its painted-on scowl. That immediately put me at ease couldn't work the late night shift without having that hard shell of an exterior. 
but if I could touch a sense of humor, he probably wouldn't be throwing me out anytime soon. I don't get a lot of people coming in here just to browse, he said, his voice having moved slightly away from the gravelly grumble he was using before. Less Bob Dylan, more Bob's Burgers. Most know exactly what they want by the time they lay eyes on this place. I shrugged. What can I say, I'm an impulsive sort. Hey, how much is this? I lifted up a snow globe that held what looked like a large hospital. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow. Good eye, that's $200. I whistled, immediately placing it carefully back on the rack. Pricey for a paperweight. Collector's item. There are a lot of stories inside that little snow globe. You could probably get a couple thousand from the right buyer if you're fine dealing with that kind of person. I take it since you're selling it for $200, you're not fine with that? The corner of the shopkeeper's mouth twitched again. I could tell he was warming to me. I'm pretty sure you're not here for that old thing anyways. What am I here for then? I'm not sure yet. Keep browsing, I'm sure you'll find it. I did as I was told. An antique set of writing quills, what looked like a defunct Tesla coil, a compass and a sextant, a typewriter, a VCR, a few old board games I'd never heard of, and a few other raggedy children's toys, including an actual raggedy Ann doll. Nothing really struck my fancy until I was flipping through a rack of clothing and came across a treasure. I delightedly snatched it up and approached the front counter, placing it in front of the shopkeeper. He raised another eyebrow at me and I beamed a smile at him in return. I've always wanted one of these, I chortled. The shopkeeper shook his head and pressed a few buttons on the archaic register. Not Faye then. Never met a Faye with a decent sense of humor. For the white t-shirt with I'm with stupid written on it, that'll be a buck fifty-three. I fished a handful of coins out of my pocket and counted out exact change. He took it and sorted the money into the correct slots. He looked back up at me and shook his head. This has got to be the dumbest sale I've made this year. I'm not even sure why that was on the rack. Hey, I'm not complaining, I said, pulling the new purchase over the shirt I was already wearing. Did you just open? I walk by this area pretty often, and I'm sure I've never seen you here before. The man's smile came out fully into the open. Yes and no. We've been in business for a long time, but I guess you could say we're new to the area. Well, I hope you stick around for a while, Hal, I said, nodding with feigned understanding as I extended my hand. You've got a bunch of weird shit in here, and there aren't many other places for me to go shopping at this time of night. Butch! The shopkeeper replied, shaking my outstretched hand. Excuse me? My name's Butch, not Hal. What the hell would the owner be doing working the front counter at 3 a.m.? I threw my head back and laughed. I stand corrected. Butch grinned. So not an incubus, not a fay, not a vamp. What the hell are you doing in my shop? I raised an eyebrow. Buying vintage clothing, apparently. No, seriously, what's your deal? Shapeshifter, Wendigo, Cannibal? Dude, I've worked enough retail to know all about the normal customer archetypes, but I think you've lost me on these. Is a shapeshifter one of those shoplifters who keeps showing up in different clothes like they're actually fooling anyone? Butch looked at me in perplexity, but a little bell rang announcing the arrival of another customer before he could continue his line of questioning. We both glanced towards the door instinctually, and I suddenly also began wondering what the hell I was doing in this store. The woman who had just entered was tall, disturbingly tall. At least that was my first impression. I soon realized, though, that she wasn't actually tall. She was just floating a solid two feet off the ground. She wore a long, pale white and semi-transparent dress that fell clearly past her feet and dragged gently on the floor. A white veil was pinned to her unkempt mane of dark hair and spread across her face. That veil did nothing to disguise the bloodshot and sorrowful eyes, the broken nose nor the mouth that hung open to the center of her chest, leaving a large black void from her cracked and broken top teeth to well past her neck. I recoiled in horror, slipping and falling directly onto my ass before scooting myself back until my back hit a rack of shelves and a hairy taxidermied hand fell onto my lap. I held up it up in preparation to do battle should I need to. The specter, however, paid me absolutely no mind. 
She merely glided down one of the aisles, raised her hand to delicately select something off a shelf, and then floated back up to Butch's counter. Evening, Maeve, just the usual? Butch asked casually. The woman's cavernous mouth seemed to open wider, and a reverberating moan began to vibrate my soul. It wasn't loud, but it suddenly reminded me of the sound I heard my mother make over my grandfather's deathbed when I was nine years old. All right, gorgeous, it's 4.50. The woman in white reached out a hand limply and dropped a handful of crumpled bills on the counter. She then turned and slowly glided out of the door. My shaking hands continued to point the furry limb at her long past, the point she was out of sight. Throat lozenges, stated Butch. I swept the leg to point at him, my heart still racing and my eyes wide. Butch seemed unconcerned. Maeve comes in every night for a pack. Her work leaves her throat pretty sore. I'm not sure if they do much good, but it's always the regulars who keep a business afloat. That was a fucking banshee, I almost screamed. Butch's eyebrows raised as though impressed. Wow, he said. I'm impressed. Most humans wouldn't recognize one on sight. Hey, could you stop pointing that thing at me? They can get a little unpredictable if you're not used to them. I kept my impromptu weapon trained on him for another moment before allowing my hand still tightly clenched to fall into my lap. I continued to breathe shakily for another moment and tried to get my head straight. I'm sorry, I said once I felt like I could speak without screaming. That was really not something I expected to see tonight. What the fuck, Butch? Banshees are fucking real? And they come in here every night for pharyngitis treatment? What the fuck is this place? I realized my voice was starting to gain volume again. I stopped, swallowed, and took another raspy breath. Sorry, I said again. I've never reacted well when I get really scared. Believe me, I wish that didn't happen to me, but... The thing still clasped in my hand suddenly lurched. I curiously glanced down at it only just then fully noticing what I had been clenching in my fist. Fuck. This is a monkey's paw, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, you may want to put that down before you make another wish, said Butch, an amused smile on his face. Why, what did I say? Still scared. Of what? Oh, right, ugly banshee chick. Nah, I'm good now. Why do my pants smell bad? Butch rolled his eyes. Go ahead and grab a new pair, no charge. Nice. Can I use your bathroom? He nodded towards the far wall of the shop. Purple door. I'd avoid opening any others if I were you. Spoil sport. Is that elevator real? Yep. And no, I'm not answering any follow-up questions until I can't smell you anymore. Ten minutes later, I was feeling much cleaner, if slightly chilly in my newly bought I'm with stupid t-shirt and newly gifted cum slut booty shorts. I must have been starting to grow on Butch because other than another twitch of his mouth and slight shake of his head, he didn't much react to my change in style. So you're actually just straight human, aren't you? He asked ruefully. I can't think of another species that would so flagrantly disregard their own self-respect. Never seen the video of the otter raping a decapitated fish head, have you? You know what I mean. Even the blood orgy folk will still show up in something tailored, at least. Butch, you just had a floating girl in here wearing funeral clothes. Versace. Maeve's taste is old-fashioned, but always quality. I paused with my mouth open before shutting it slowly. All right, then. I guess I stand corrected. Should I change so I don't offend the blood orgy folk? I finally got a full laugh from Butch. What's your name, kid? Clear? Sorry? Clear. Middle name is Water. My parents were hippies. Also big fans of revivals. Man. Thought I drew the short straw when it came to names. But you've got me beat. So what? The shop bell rang again. Unlike with the previous customer, I felt not even the slightest twinge of fear as the latest monster strolled casually into the building. Six and a half feet tall and covered in reddish-brown fur, the man with the overtly canine face was sporting a cordial grin. The werewolf nodded casually at Butch and began strolling the aisles. Butch nodded back and then raised an eyebrow at me as though interested in my newfound stoicism. Well, he asked, as if unsure whether or not I was going to shit myself again. 
I can't believe you gave me a hard time about my booty shorts, and then didn't blink at that guy dropping werewolf dong. Butch grunted in satisfaction. Guess that monkey's paw was the real deal. I should bump up the price. You didn't know? He shook his head. It's good policy not to fuck around with a monkey's paw. Had a feeling it was legit, though. A lot of the other stuff we got from that particular estate ended up being pretty extraordinary. There was a pause. Such as? I demanded. Come on, dude. You can't drop that line and then not show off a bit. Butch laughed again and turned around to the display wall behind the counter. He pulled down a shadow box and laid it on the counter in front of me. Inside was an almost cartoonishly large revolver. Six chamber but with a bulbous barrel that could have fired a ski ball. There were three huge rounds already loaded, but with no caliber that I recognized. You seem like the kind of guy who would appreciate this. He opened the case and gestured for me to pick it up. I did, immediately surprised by its apparent weightlessness. I spun it around my finger, gunslinger style, and leveled it harmlessly towards the doors at the end of the hall. The werewolf glanced up at me curiously for a moment before returning to his shopping. Love the way it handles, but I don't recognize the make. One of a kind, Butch said. They call it the Chekhov gun. I laughed. Seriously? Guess I have to fire it then, huh? Probably, but I wouldn't waste the ammo if you don't have to. Those three rounds are all there are left. How very hackneyed, I said, examining one of the rounds. These things seem a bit unnecessary unless you're hunting kaiju. What are they? I've just taken to calling them MacGuffins. I've only seen it used once, during a debate over the bathroom being only for paying customers. One thing led to another, and a full army of vampires ended up laying siege to the shop. Had to have been at least four or five hundred of them. Hal shot off a round from this and it fired an actual sun. Gave me second degree burns on every exposed inch of skin. But it fried every last one of those fuckers. Wait, it shoots a sun? I asked incredulously cautiously setting the gun back on the counter. No, it shoots whatever it has to to get the job done, Butch explained. That makes no sense whatsoever. You do realize there's a werewolf browsing through old Megadeth CDs ten feet behind you, right? I turned around and locked eyes with the large hairy fellow for a moment. His tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth in a wolfish smile, and he winked at me. So, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I still think there's a big difference between ancient legends and a relatively modern literary construct. Butch opened his mouth to respond, but at that moment the door slammed open with enough force to cause the lights to flicker. I glanced over my shoulder at the darkened doorway, noticing Butch's hand move to rest lightly on the Chekhov gun on the counter. The werewolf's hackless raised as a low growl began to rumble from his direction. The man in the doorway seemed human enough, if high-stakes lawyers could be considered human, that is, he was tall, but not intimidatingly so. His suit was well-tailored, his hair immaculate. The charming smile on his face belied the cold contempt in his eyes. Hey, Butch, he said, his voice a purring baritone. Hey, as long time no see, Butch replied, his face devoid of emotion. Way too long. The man pulled a coin from his pocket and began rolling it back and forth across his fingers. Is your boss around? You know I haven't seen Hal in months, as not since that incident with the purgatory delegation. Paychecks are still rolling in, though, so he's out there somewhere. If you find him, let him know I'm taking the fender for a Christmas bonus. As shook his head in feigned disappointment. It really would be in your best interest to help me track him down, Butch. You know the deal he made to run this place expired at the end of last month. Now my employer has a lot of respect for the old man and everything he's done over the years so he's more than willing to renegotiate the terms. Butch shook his head. You're not hearing me, As. I don't know where the guy is, and I don't have any way of getting a hold of him. Come on, you really mean to tell me your boss can't suss out where he is? I'm starting to get why his little rebellion failed. Still not sure how he duped all you idiots into following his lead, though. Was that like a Trump thing? As's eyes narrowed. That's low even for you, Butch. I laughed involuntarily. I don't know, man, if the MAGA hat fits. Suddenly, a force slammed into me, hurling me over the counter and against the wall behind the register. Shock shuddered through my body as a display hook pierced my shoulder. 
A flood of moisture spread down my back, and I immediately started feeling a little woozy. Also a lot pissed. I jerked my head up to glare at Az. Motherfucker, I just bought this shirt. I felt myself reverse direction flying off the wall and across the store. I flailed painfully as I soared, managing to tip over one of the racks before colliding with the werewolf. I couldn't help but marvel at how soft he was as we hit the floor and slid into another rack, bringing its contents down on us. I always envisioned werewolf fur as being more coarse, I thought as I waited out the falling inventory. Sorry, Jack, I muttered, rolling away from the werewolf and painfully climbing to my feet. Cool if I call you Jack? Never caught your actual name. Jack growled, shaking his head like a wet dog. Ah. I don't know why you have to make me hurt your friends before you tell me what I want to know, Butch. You know how much it pains me to hurt innocent bystanders. Butch was levitating over the cash register, his limbs shaking violently as he appeared to reflexively attempt to swallow his own tongue. I started grabbing anything within reach and throwing it at Az. I managed to score a direct hit with a tea kettle and an old computer mouse, but it was the lawn dart directly to the head that finally got his attention. Butch took in a raspy breath and fell to the ground as Az's head spun around to glare at me. His hand shot up and I felt my windpipe close. My hands instinctively went to my neck as I tried desperately to take in air. Idiot child, rasped Az, his eyes appearing a dull red as the edges of my vision began to darken. Do you have any idea who you're... I lost the rest of his sentence as Jack launched himself into Az, and the two of them flew into another rack. I fell to my knees, sucking in air and letting the world come back into focus. It sounded like Jack got one or two good swipes in with his vicious-looking claws before he flew backwards again, crashing through one of the doors at the back of the store. What lay beyond remained unknown, as the door immediately reformed behind him, pulling back in its shattered wood until no trace of damage remained. As his head came bobbing into sight over the racks, I got back to my feet. This whole lack of fear thing was really starting to grow on me. You can force choke me all you want, Vader, I snarled at him. We both know you're just a whiny little sand-hating bitch. As his face was filled with fury, as he raised his hand to smite me again, suddenly, Butch stepped between us. The Chekhov gun leveled squarely at Az's head. Az's look turned to one of contempt, but his hand still lowered slightly. How many of those bullets are you down to, Butch? He asked. Two? Three? Are you really sure you want to waste one on little old me? What then will you use on the one he sends after me? Or the one after that? Eventually the big man himself will want to come, better hope you still have at least one left for him. My eyes fell on another gun that had fallen onto the floor in the struggle, one that I had noticed on my first walk through of the aisles. A stupid idea popped into my head. I reached down and grabbed it, cocking it loudly as I leveled it towards Az. Step aside, Butch, I growled. Butch shot a look back at me saw what I held, and gave me a tight grin as he lowered the Chekhov gun and stepped out of my way. I squeezed the trigger on the Super Soaker XP-100 and sent a stream of water directly into Az's face. His scream was piercing as the smoke immediately started pouring off his melting face. I stepped towards him, continuously pumping more water as I adjusted my stream to any piece of exposed skin, his squirming left exposed. The power of Christ compels you, bitch, I yelled as I stood over him, furiously pumping the squirt gun. Don't fuck with retail workers. Flesh fell from the demon's bones like really good barbecue ribs, bubbling into vapor from the floor. His screams became so high-pitched that I heard a few of the more delicate glass items in the shop shatter. I didn't let up on the stream of water until the plastic toy lost pressure and dribbled to a stop. As collapsed his clothes falling into a pile on the floor as his body steamed away. I stood panting, feeling the adrenaline burning off my skin. My shoulder, forgotten during the fight, began to throb painfully and the squirt gun slipped from my grasp. Did you seriously just use a Pulp Fiction line on me? I looked up at Butch in surprise and started to laugh. I mean, how often am I really going to have an opportunity like that? I just couldn't resist. He chuckled along with me. How'd you know that Super Soaker would work? You made it pretty easy to figure out what he was with all that boss's rebellion talk. And I thought with the kind of shit you have in here. 
there was a pretty decent chance that thing was filled with holy water. Anyway, if it wasn't, I knew you'd probably just look at me like I was an idiot and shoot him with the Chekhov gun instead. So you know, what the hell. He chuckled again and walked over to me to examine my shoulder. How's it look? I asked through gritted teeth. I mean, you're going to need stitches probably, but I don't think you're going to bleed out anytime soon. I nodded, then glanced over at the back of the shop towards the door Jack had disappeared through. Is he going to be all right? I asked. Jack? He replied. Yeah, he'll be fine. He's a pretty solid guy, has friends everywhere. I'm sure someone over there will put him up until he finds his way back. Holy shit, his name really is Jack? I thought I was just being clever. Nobody knows his real name, actually. He doesn't talk much. But most people end up landing on that joke eventually, so it's kind of just stuck. Ow, my self-esteem. I deadpanned. What's over there? Over where? You said someone over there will put him up. What's over there? Oh, that door leads to the back rooms. It opens up somewhere different every time, so you usually have to find another way back if you go through it. I nodded, not really understanding, but increasingly distracted by the radiating pain in my shoulder. Well, let me know next time you see him. I think I owe that guy a beer. Next question. Where is the nearest hospital? He grinned. Come on, I'll patch you up. Gotten pretty good at it over the years working this job. Only lost a couple dozen patients. I nodded and followed as he led to another door behind the cash register. He stopped with his hand on the knob. Oh. And remember how I was trying to figure out why you ended up finding this place? I think I figured it out. Want a job? I looked at him. I thought about the banshee and the monkey's paw and the werewolf and the demon. Then I thought about the long series of dead-end boring jobs I'd had up until this point. Do you have a dental plan? My third week working at Hal's found me shoveling harpy shit. The filthy birds used their horrifically scarred, twisted, and just generally unattractive human heads to hurl insults at me as the sweat dripped down my face. Cleaning this particular cage was always rough, as the dirty hybrids took a great deal of joy in trying to add to the mess faster than I could clean it. My poop cart was half full of a variety of dung, having already cleaned out the unicorn, chupacabra, thunderbird, and yeti cages. I'm not sure exactly what bizarre combination of chemistry and magic was happening but somehow the scent emanating from the cart reminded me of quality chicken parmesan. Hey, cocksucker, liking that smell? Want a taste from the source? Screeched Blanche from high above me. The four disgusting creatures laughed raucously and started lobbing down additional work for me to enjoy. Rose fluttered down to stare at me. If you're going to be doing butt stuff with us, you're going to need some lube. And she spat directly at my face. I swung up my pitchfork to block the spittle immediately sizzling through one of the tines and dripping to the straw-covered floor. Rose, I said sternly, if you ruin my equipment, I'm just going to head back to the thrift shop and you can spend the next week swimming in compost. Rose snorted at me and flapped her way back up the perches, where her sisters sat chortling. I slipped back on my headphones to drown out the screeching vitriol and continued with my chores. Internally, I reminded myself that I was still in my training period which, much like many of my previous jobs, mostly consisted of doing all the work that Butch didn't want to do. Still, though, I thought, as I used the remaining part of the pitchfork to lift another load of rancid harpy shit, this was better than working at Denny's. Despite the intrinsically unpleasant nature of the cleanup, I genuinely enjoyed spending time in the menagerie. Ten-year-old me had been utterly obsessed with cryptids, so getting the opportunity to crawl into a large pen and cuddle with a couple dozen jackalopes was kind of a dream come true. Not to mention the weekly poker games with the centaurs. I had doubled my first paycheck when I realized they were incapable of understanding the concept of bluffing. Half an hour later, and I could finally walk across the harpy cage and actually feel the firmness of the floor beneath my feet. Exhaling explosively, I pulled the wheelbarrow out of the cage, locked the door behind me and leaned tiredly against the bars. I allowed my eyes to wander around the store as I tried to will my muscles into relaxation. Much like the thrift shop, the menagerie seemed to have been organized by an utter madman. Large beasts were housed next to tiny, predators next to prey, 
those capable of speech across from those who mostly just roared or screeched. The only exception was the largest animals, dragons, mammoths, the bipolar cyclops, etc., who were all held by the far west wall where the ceiling was highest. A soft bell rang as a customer entered. I stabbed the pitchfork into the pile of waste, pulled off my headphones, and began walking towards the front to make myself available. Behind me, Dorothy made a comment on my backside that would have been flattering from anyone else, and sent another bomb through the bars to splatter at my feet. I was fully prepared to launch into a formal retail greeting, but my words caught in my throat as I saw who had entered. Dark hair, full lips, green-gray eyes that pierced through every defense I possessed, a low-cut blouse that presented a couple very convincing reasons to break eye contact. This woman's beauty was otherworldly. Actually, considering the nature of most of my clientele, otherworldly was probably more literal than literary. She smiled at me and I forgot my standard greeting, my name, and how to breathe. Hey there, new guy, she purred softly. King illegal forest to pig wild killin' at A is, I responded wittily. She blinked. Well, that one's new. Excuse me for a moment. I turned and walked over to the barrel full of coconut rum I had prepared to feed the Rougarou and dunked my head in, taking in a few large mouthfuls. I re-emerged, dripping, cold, and a little queasy from the taste. Let me try that again, I said. Nothing like a full immersion in alcohol to help talk to a woman way out of your league. Hi, welcome to Hal's Low Cost Menagerie. My name's Clear, how can I help you? The woman smiled broadly. I must say you handled that better than a lot of men. A lot of things get easier once a guy embraces his own idiocy. What brings you in today? Ingredients, food, or companionship? I actually just needed to have a word with Butch. Is he around? Butch should be covering the counter in the thrift shop. If you wanted to look around for a bit, I can run and grab him for you. Maybe in a minute. It's been a long time since I've been in this part of the shop. She stepped forward and looped her arm with mine. And since this is the section I walked into, I think the shop wants us to get acquainted. Goosebumps raised instantly on the part of her arm that touched mine, which immediately brought up a twinge of nervous suspicion. Butch had insisted that I reverse my monkey paw wish, quite understandably of the opinion that fear was absolutely necessary to keep oneself from doing something idiotically reckless in an environment like Hal's. We worked on the wording of the wish for a ridiculously long time to restore my fear, allow me to function while afraid without crapping my pants, and to avoid any comically ironic twists. It seemed to work out pretty well, although I had noticed that the more scared I became, the more I would impulsively make sardonic comments. Butch didn't seem to notice that part, since it fit my personality like a glove. I led the distractingly beautiful woman through the dank maze of cages, allowing her to direct the duration spent admiring each of the animals. She had obviously been around the mythical block a few times, since she barely seemed impressed by some of the more commonplace residents, like the Chimeras and the Jersey Devils. She hurried past the harpy cages as the four of them immediately began to harmonize in a repetitive chant of whore, but she did fall instantly in love with the three-headed Quokas. Brushing off my warnings, I had seen a few of the more mature ones let out small belches of fire. She released my arm and climbed directly into the pen with them, laying down and allowing them to curiously climb over her while she laughed delightedly. Oh, I love these, she exclaimed. What are they? They were just discovered a couple weeks ago. We decided to call them Chalamets. Chalamets? Yeah, because they're cute, but also kind of off-putting. She laughed again as one of them began to shimmy its body down the front of her blouse. I sternly told myself that it was ridiculous to be jealous of a rodent. The woman rose gracefully back to her feet. The Chalamet still nestled comfortably between her breasts. Two of its heads were sticking out of the top of her shirt, looking around gleefully. The third seemed to have fallen asleep against the swell of her cleavage. Lucky jerk. I guess I've been chosen she declared, climbing carefully out of the pen. This little guy's coming home with me. The pets pick the owners, I agreed. We can get you checked out in the thrift shop if you still needed to talk to Butch, Ms. Babs. I was incredibly confused for a moment because the voice that spoke her name 
was not the dulcet music she had used before, but rather masculine and gruff and gravelly. Also, it seemed to be coming from behind me. Butch was standing next to the Kelpie stalls. His customary scowl had descended into a disgusted grimace. Babs gave him a smile that would have lit up a cemetery, but Butch didn't soften so much as a werewolf's hair. I thought we agreed that it would be best if you stayed away from the shop, Butch said, his voice dangerous. I thought that was more of a suggestion, Babs entreated. I didn't think you had actually trespassed me. That suggestion was based off the assumption that you didn't want to see me any more than I wanted to see you. Butch, come on, don't be like that. It's been, what, 50 years since the last time we saw each other? Think for a minute. Would I stay away that long only to show up now if it wasn't important? Why do you have a Chalamet between your tits? Babs crossed her hands across her chest protectively. Even someone like me needs an emotional support animal, Butch. Get a harpy, then. You'd have more in common. I knew it was you who got them to call me that. I started laughing uncontrollably. Butch and Babs paused their fighting to stare at me. Butch, you absolute rascal, I chortled. You never told me you used to be married. It's not often that you get to witness an actual miracle, so I made sure to relish every second that I was able to see Butch blush. Babs suddenly became very occupied scratching a basilisk behind its ear. My shit-eating grin stayed on my face as I forced a big hug on Butch. Man, she is way too hot for you. What, are you actually rich or something? Is this the part where I ask for a raise or hang on, was it a physical thing? Wait here, I'm gonna go get a ruler. Butch pulled away angrily. Clear, is there any way I can convince you to just not be yourself right now? Not a chance, DeMarco. You know I have a terminal case of not knowing when to shut up, so... I sat down on the wheelbarrow full of dung and leaned back comfortably, my stomach growling at the smell. How did you two meet? Also, Babs, does that mean you're single now? The look Butch gave me was disgusted. I returned it with an impish grin. You really have no concept of appropriate, do you, Clear? We work in a second-hand shop. This is kind of what we do. Butch sighed and Babs tried unsuccessfully to suppress a smile. I think I like this one, Butch, she told him. Yeah, you would. Maybe you should just tell me why you're here, Butch said to her. I'm not sure if I have the energy to play around today. Well, that sounds familiar. Babs, come on. Babs's grin flickered and fell. Butch, Hal's been hiding out at my place for the last few months. He went missing yesterday. Butch's face didn't change, but he did fall silent. Babs seemed to be silently pleading with him to hear her out and he was obviously considering it. Finally, he glanced over at me. Clear, I think we need a couple minutes. The Becks just got in with a new shipment. Will you go sign them in and restock, please? There were times to joke and there were times to just leave people to their conversation. I had a hard time telling the difference sometimes, or most of the time, but I had learned that when Butch asked politely, it was probably for the best to just follow his lead. I nodded silently, and made my way to the elevator at the back of the menagerie. In the elevator, I took a moment to consider the whole conversation I had just witnessed. Hal had been staying with Butch's ex-wife. That actually made a lot of sense. I knew Hal and Butch had been pretty famously tight, so the last place anyone would have expected Hal to go would be Butch's ex-wife. And what did that mean for Babs? Butch was one of the most formidable people I knew, but even he had spoken of Hal with a bit of awe. If Hal went to Babs for protection, God only knows what she must be capable of. Honestly, it probably meant she was exactly my type, i.e. a really bad idea. No, I wasn't really going to try to hook up with her, tempting though it may be. But she did strike me as someone who would play along with my attempts to get a rise out of Butch. I shook myself out of my thoughts and pressed the TC button on the panel. I felt the slowly becoming familiar lurch in my stomach. My hand instinctively reached out to brace myself against the wall as the tiny room began racing off to the left. That surprised the hell out of me the first time I'd ridden this thing. I had tried to figure out how any of it was possible at first, but pretty quickly decided I liked not having a migraine more. The elevator entered its cruising speed, so I placed my hand on the other wall to prepare for the equally jarring deceleration. While I waited, my eyes scanned down the button panel again. There were six of them. 
Well, nine if you count the door open, door close, we're all gonna die buttons. Besides the TC, where I was going, and the M from where I'd just been, there were also buttons for FD, our fine dining restaurant, LH, our love hotel, and one actually managed to fit in Bosic, the Blue Dorgi Suite and Event Center. The final button was at the bottom, and it just said D. Butch hadn't told me what that one went to, just to never go down there, unless Saiten himself was on my tail. I decided that it was prudent to take him at his word on that one. I felt my weight shift shift towards my bracing hand. I tried not to think about how far I had traveled in the last three minutes. I hadn't stepped outside from the menagerie exit yet, but I knew the restaurant opened just outside Brussels, and that trip only took about a minute thirty. The elevator ground to a halt, and the doors opened to the thrift store. No customers, fortunately. Butch had assured me that stealing from the place was impossible, but even in the supernatural realms, customers became pissy when they had to wait. The Becks were not customers, though, so they just had to put up with waiting. Four of them stood next to the front counter, three boys and one girl. A pallet with several layers of boxes was floating about six inches off the ground next to them. As usual, their faces were identical and expressionless. Their blonde hair was cut in the same early Beatles bowl cut. Their eyes were the same deep black voids. About time, asshole, the tallest of them grumbled. It always amused me that despite their appearance, they always sounded like middle-aged teamsters. Deepest apologies, my tallest, I intoned mournfully while dipping into a florid bow. Standing back up, I slipped back into my normal speech. Seriously, though, I'm really not. I was watching Butch meet up with the ex he hasn't seen in 50 years. Believe me, totally worth it. The tallest snorted. Babs is back, huh? That poor guy. She's had centuries of experience manipulating men like him. Hey, uh, I'm still new here. This was the first I'd heard of her. You guys want to fill me in on some backstory? The girl shook her head. Not our business, kid. We deal in inventory, not gossip. Union rules. Nothing wrong with a little idle conversation, Munchkin. Call me that again and you'll lose a finger. I believe you, short stuff. Come on, I just want to know how large the pile of shit I'm standing in is. Another of the boys blew out a breath. Look, we really don't pay much attention. She was here a lot, and then she wasn't. I know she worked for meth, so she spent most of her time down in the restaurant. I blinked in surprise. Didn't see that coming. Whatever, I'm pretty sure most of us have a past we're not so proud of, and working in the restaurant would make sense if she was on meth. The tallest spoke again. Quit thinking like an idiot, clear. M-E-T-H, monsters for the ethical treatment of humans. Babs used to make sure the people they served down in the restaurant were treated humanely and that they didn't suffer unnecessarily during the slaughtering process. Oh nice, she struck me as the humanitarian sort. Any idea why they split? Butch's old assistant kept on jokingly flirting with her, so Butch killed him. Oh fuck, really? No, not really. Now will you please sign the damn paperwork so we can get back to work? I grabbed the outstretched clipboard, signed my name at the bottom, and handed it back. The tallest tore off the receipt copy and handed it back to me. The four of them walked in lockstep out of the door as I turned to begin the unloading process. Curious as I was about what Butch and Babs were talking about, I had to admit that this was my favorite part of the job. The paperwork identified this as estate sale procurements, which meant a 50-50 chance of it being junk or awesome. The Becks were good at picking out items of significance, but a well-loved children's toy or a serial killer's trophy collection had a tendency to set off that same bell in their heads. I was met with disappointment for the first eight boxes. Well, mostly. I did find myself spending an inordinate amount of time studying a fascinating painting of what appeared to be a Soviet-era army marching across an ocean with the silhouette of the Golden Gate Bridge, barely visible in the background. A pod of fish painted with the Soviet flag swam about the advancing army's feet. I decided to hang it behind the cash register so I could study it more in depth later. There was definitely something to it since it took every ounce of concentration to pull my eyes off of it. I struck gold on the ninth box where I found a translated copy of the Voynich Manuscript, an unabridged version of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, twelve missing books of Homer, one of which was titled, That Time Achilles and Odysseus Totally Boned, 
a strange red hat that smelled like sulfur-flavored ambergris and looked like it was perpetually coated with sand, and a small bow complete with arrow-filled quiver that all appeared to be plated in gold. Pulling out one of the arrows, I noticed that they seemed to be quite intentionally phallic. I quickly double-checked everything in the box off the inventory list the Bex gave me and set it aside for butch set prices. I found a few other decent items scattered through the rest of the boxes, but I handled them myself due to us having very similar items already in stock. Mass-produced grimoires, a few tarot decks, a couple haunted toys, a number of enchanted pieces of clothing, things like that. At the bottom of the final box, since that's how these things always go for some reason, I found trouble. The moment I picked up the forest green book with High Clear written in Comic Sans on the front cover, I knew there was no way anything good could come of it. But of course, I immediately said, Hi book, nice to meet you, and opened it. The first line of the first page simply read, Ha, you fucking idiot. And it began to glow red hot in my hands. I dropped it, since I had completely ignored the Masha requirements of protective equipment when handling untested magical artifacts. On the floor, the book flipped its pages towards the center and began to emit a bubble of green light. Oh, God damn it! I yelled and quickly ran behind the register to grab the canister of pure salt we kept under the counter for situations like this. I managed to get a circle drawn around the book just before the bubble burst and again, Hideus praying mantis looking thing flew directly at me. It hit the barrier with a dull thud, looked down at the circle of salt, and hissed audibly. I let out an audible breathe as my heart pounded away in my chest. It twisted its arms and waved them in front of its face, immediately transforming into a woman with short red hair and piercing eyes. The wings stayed in place though, flapping softly to keep her aloft and looking down in contempt at me. Release me, she whispered fiercely at me. I stared back at her, wanting to think she was cute, but unable to get her insect form far enough out of my head to consider it. I know there is much we can learn from each other if we can negotiate a truce. We can find a way to coexist. Can there be a peace between us? Peace? No peace. Release me now. Man, Butch said you guys didn't have a sense of humor, but you just rolled with that one straight away. Rolled with what, human? I said release me this instant. Wait, you mean those scriptwriters actually came up with realistic dialogue for that scene? Huh, who would have thunk it? She threw up her hands. Why must I always be caught by humans who make no sense? I think that might say more about you than me, sweetie. The yellow door at the far end of the shop burst open, and a tall, lanky fellow covered in red-brown fur casually strolled in. Jack, I yelled enthusiastically. So far as I knew, nobody had laid eyes on him since he disappeared through that door on my first day. Jack sauntered over to me and gave me a fist bump before clapping me on the shoulder with camaraderie. He glanced up at the fairy briefly, who bared a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth at him. He flipped her off in return. Where you been? Butch told me you'd be okay, but I was started to get a little worried. Jack reached into a pocket of fur and withdrew a small business card to hand over. In a small typeset, it simply said, The Backrooms. I flipped it over to see a small description of the itsy bitsy teeny weeny multiversal in between eye. Yep, that definitely clears it all up. He grinned at me. Well, let me buy you a drink down in the restaurant before you head out tonight. I definitely owe you one. He nodded at me. Then he shot a questioning glance up at the fairy trapped in her circle of salt. I have no idea. Butch told me how to trap her, but not what to do with her after. Any thoughts? Jack shrugged and fired a finger gun at her. That's a thought. It's iron rounds for fairies, right? Since I had absolutely no idea where Butch kept the iron bullets, it was probably for the best that he chose that moment to come through the elevator door. What's all this then? He asked taking in the scene with a bewildered look. Jack! yelled Babs from behind Butch with delight. She ran towards him and launched herself into his surprised embrace, burying her face into his fur. The Chalamet squeezed out from between them and scrambled up to the top of Jack's head, chittering in annoyance. Ever so slowly I watched as Jack and Babs began to lose balance and tip backwards. It probably would have resulted in everyone sharing a good-natured laugh at their expense, if they didn't fall directly onto the salt line. The fairy wasted no time flipping straight back into her praying mantis form and flying straight at me. 
I managed to duck underneath of her just before impact, but her back talons managed to swipe against my raised forearm, drawing a thin line of blood. She quickly made for the front door, but a quick shout of, Hey Siri, set Fay protection wards, from Butch blocked her exit with a cross-cross of bright purple lines. She spun on us furiously, her face darting around the shop for another way out. Babs and Jack were pulling themselves back to their feet, but Butch was already in action, running through an aisle with his hands deftly swiping items off the shelves. Clear, get the salt ready! Butch shouted at me. Sensing that he was probably the largest threat in the room, the fairy went for Butch next. He slid to a stop at the end of the aisle and stood his ground. When she got close enough to him for Babs to let out a yell of concern, Butch reached into his pocket and threw a cloud of powder into her face. They must have been iron fillings or something, because she immediately shrieked and started trying to claw it out of her eyes. Butch moved in closer, an iron bar in his hand ready to finish her off, but one of her flailing wings caught him in the head and sent him sprawling. She shook her insectile face, and her reddened eyes fell on me standing in front of the cash register holding the bag of salt. Jack and Babs came at her from either side, but a powerful flap of her wings sent them flying. I stared dumbly at her as she began to race straight at me, her face filled with rage. I looked around helplessly for anything within reach that might help me in this fight. The Chekhov gun was too far away, nothing nearby was made with iron. Really, the only thing within reach that might work was... I grabbed the painting of the Soviet army walking on water and held it up between me and the charging fay. The impact never came. I lowered the painting just enough for me to look over the top and saw her examining the painting while tapping her chin thoughtfully with her long, thin tarsi. Interesting, she said. Is this intended as a Cold War propaganda piece? If so, which side is it for? A warning for the West or an aspiration for the East? I'm not sure, I replied, calmly walking around the counter and pretending to contemplate the painting while surreptitiously beginning to reform the salt circle around her. I thought at first that it was just a depiction of some kind of Orwellian future, but now I'm starting to wonder if it's something way more insidious. This might actually be an original Alexander Samukvalov, she said, fascinated. I don't actually know, we just got it in. I haven't had a chance to get it officially appraised yet. If you're interested, though, we might be able to make a deal. I stepped back and sprinkled the last bit of salt in the bag onto the completed circle. With a quick motion, I reached over and pulled the painting away, breaking her line of sight. Dismay filled her eyes as she looked down to realize she was trapped again. Fuck me, she groaned. Sorry, I said. Really not interested when you're still in that skin. If you want to switch back to the redhead, though, we could talk about it. The fairy shot me a dirty look, but shifted back to her human form anyway. If that is the cost of my freedom, I'll do what I must do. You. No, I was kidding. Sorry I have a lot of perversions, but formicophilia is not on the list. How do you know what it is called then? I really don't have a good answer to that. I Google random things when I'm bored. Then name your desire, human, and allow me to return to my realm. Butch, Babs, and Jack had joined me around the circle at this point, and the two former lovers were exchanging a pointed look. Weirdly enough, kid, your fuck-up might have some unexpected benefits here. Babs and I were just coming to talk to you about it, actually. We need to track down Hal. This shop is in some serious trouble if the Hellspawn managed to get a hold of him. He was safe over with Babs. But now that he's vanished again, we really need to do something about this. He looked over at the trapped fairy. How about that? Can you bring Hal to us? You did not trap me, shopkeeper. My deal is not with you. Butch looked at me. All you kid? Think you're ready to go solo? I smiled at him. I was born ready. It was pretty satisfying that I even got Jack to let out an exasperated groan with that one. All right, babe. What do you think? Can you bring Hal back to us? The fairy's eyes went distant. No, he has been shielded against interference by fairy magic. I don't know how, but I cannot touch him. Well, shit. How about information? Can you tell us anything about him? She nodded. Three questions, three true answers, and you will give me my freedom? Fine, but no bullshit answers, okay? 
No, technically true, but only because homonyms exist. Answers. And nothing so cryptic that it only makes sense after we're done. You got me? Also, once you give us the answers and I break the circle, you can't hurt any of us for trapping you. Agreed. I will speak only the full truth, and we shall all depart unharmed. All right. Where is Hal? What is the quickest way for us to get to him? And what will we need to do in order to successfully find him and bring him back? She closed her eyes briefly, as if scanning her hard drive. He is currently hiding in purgatory. The blue door at the back of the shop will bring you to the realm, but then you take the subway to Terrace 5 and catch the bus to the historical district. Once there, you must have with you a servant of heaven, a denizen of hell, and a man perpetually trapped in the mortal realm. Between the four of you, you will be able to track down a social media influencer who goes by the name of Raza Mataz, who will guide you to Hal. I cannot tell whether you will succeed in convincing him to return. The uncertainty that surrounds him is too deep to see clearly, but all other paths lead to certain failure. Bear in mind these instructions are intended for you alone. If these others decide to leave you behind, these answers may no longer be truthful. All right, that'll have to do. Thank you, gorgeous. And I broke the salt circle with my foot. The fairy immediately vanished with a crack of lightning. The four of us looked at each other for a moment. That was uncharacteristically straightforward for you, Clear, Butch said, sounding slightly impressed. Eh, that whole screwing up the three questions trope has been done to death. I didn't think there was anything more I could add to it. So what's the point? Well, strangely enough, we have most of our group already here. Babs commented. All we need is a servant of heaven. Wait, really? I said, surprised. Is Jack from hell? No, I am, Babs replied. My place is located in one of hell's suburbs. And the man trapped in the mortal realm? Butch held to his hand. Right here. I will be answering no follow-up questions. He looked over at Jack. Hey, buddy, glad you made it back okay. Any chance you'd be willing to keep an eye on the shop for a few days while we go drag the owner back? Jack raised his hand and rubbed his thumb and forefinger together. Of course, I'll give you double what I'm paying Clear. Wait, what the fuck? I yelped. Shut up, Clear. You're still in training. Is that cool, Jack? Jack gave him a thumbs up. Great. So all we need to do now is track down a servant of heaven and we can get started. Right on cue. The front door opened and a fat middle-aged guy walked in, naked except for a drooping sash. He had a toothpick sticking out from his teeth and a tiny pair of soft white wings sticking out from his shoulder blades. Hey dudes, he said with a lecherous smile on his face. I just talked to a bunch of creepy kids who said you all might have my bow. A wide grin spread across my face. I think we might have what you're looking for, but technically speaking, it's our bow now. His face began to turn angry but I held up a calming hand. Let's not get off on the wrong foot here. I'm sure we can make a deal. I'm clear, by the way. It's good to meet you. He accepted my outstretched hand. You too, I suppose. I'm X-Mac. My grin grew three sizes that day. Of course you are. Hey, anyone else hungry? I'm fucking starving. Let's hit the restaurant before we get started. It has taken me a while to collect my thoughts and be able to recall all of this. By now at least eight weeks have passed since I last sat down to write in this journal. I only kept keeping this because my therapist, a cute 30-something redhead, insisted I do so. My memory has been slipping away piece by piece. Parts of weeks are gone. Plans I've made suddenly lose their spot at the forefront of my mind. I started considering trying to do dream recollection and other methods to try and help sharpen my memory, but I can't even remember if I dream anymore or not. Had it been summer already? Where had the days gone? I was still experiencing PTSD from the following event that I accounted for in my journal. Here is what I wrote. It was the very end of spring. I remember it like it was yesterday. I moved to Pittsburgh from San Antonio nearly six months prior. Adjusting to the move and my new job as a chemist at the nuclear power facility out in Beaver County, I was still adjusting to things like the time change, the temperatures, 
although it had been an awfully pleasant spring thus far. That was all about to change, apparently. It was an average day in April. I'm not exactly sure of the date. It had been a Friday. I walked out of the security gates, collected my personal belongings that weren't allowed past security, and said my goodbyes to my co-workers. The sun was not even setting yet, a nice change from the cold, dark winters of the region. However, even today as I strode along the exposed parking lot, something felt off. It felt like two beady yellow eyes were watching me. It was strange for me to suffer from paranoia, but I guess after bouts of insomnia due to a move, I had been more worse for wear than usual. As a chemist, my job really wasn't taxing or nerve-wracking. The added bonus of working on nuclear power was more of an excitement than deterrent to me, as these facilities were incredibly safe by now. To top it off, Pittsburgh was in a well-shielded region safe from the Midwest Plains, wrought with tornadoes. As well, the nearest fault line was the New Madrid, and it had been relatively inactive in recent times. So outside of human error, I really did not have much to worry about. And let's face it, humans didn't really even run these plants anymore. They were entirely digital. I unlocked my Ford F-150. I had recently picked it up to contend with the rugged terrain I'd constantly face while hiking in the summer months. As I unlocked it and prepared to open the handle, I thought I heard footsteps somewhere a few cars behind me shuffling quickly. This on top of the feeling I was being watched made me finally turn around to confront whoever was trying to prank me. All right, I half shouted. I hear you back there, who is that? Frank Monte Oliver? Frank was a systems specialist. He was your typical blue-collared, football and beer-loving 54-year-old. Monte was a Frenchman here to do work as an exchange program with Electricité de France. Oliver was a quiet 20-something soft air engineer, and despite his shy, introverted nature, once you got to know him, you uncovered a remarkable sense of humor and dry sarcasm. A very bright kid. I had been in my field for over 20 years, working on projects ranging from cancer drug trials to less legal chemical concoctions. I laid my first LSD tabs at 19 years old in the dark room of the photography lab at the University of Texas. It was a wild ride those days, but I had since settled down and had made myself more than I could have hoped for in so far as my career and life. Things had been great. Come on guys, this isn't funny. I snapped back from my thoughts on my co-workers and just realized that nobody had answered me. Strange, I thought. Surely this was some kind of joke. Maybe I had been awake too long. My brain wasn't making the connection that a pile of leaves could have blown across the parking lot. And here I am, standing here, looking like a crazy person, shouting at someone that wasn't there. I chuckled to myself and turned to my truck, climbing in it, but still not able to shake the sense that someone or something was watching me. I turned the keys to the ignition and the roar of the engine helped drown out the nervous silence that surrounded the nearly empty parking lot. I took off not wanting to look back in fear that I might actually see my phantom pursuer. As I drove away, the feeling intensified, and as it did, the accelerometer needle crept higher and higher as I sped home. The lock to my front door turned and the door swung open as I walked into the entryway and let out a long sigh of relief. Home. Home was a small ranch house in an outlying township of Allegheny County the county that Pittsburgh is located in. Directly southwest of the city, I could be to the various entertainment and sporting events in less than 15 minutes. On the other hand, I could escape to wild and wonderful West Virginia in about a half hour. It was a much better balance than the hot streets of San Antonio and the even hotter surrounding deserts. My ranch had three bedrooms, two full baths, a nice sit-down kitchen with an island and a smart fridge, a connected dining room and adjoining living room. With no upstairs, I slept, worked, ate, and bathed, all on the same floor. I had laundry and laundry chute in the basement, as well as an additional TV and futon for guests who had maybe had one too many drinks at my place. I hadn't thrown a party yet, but now that I'd begun to get to know my co-workers, I was planning on it soon. I checked the back door, which led off my dining room, and looked into my backyard. Nothing. Just a white fenced-in yard, surrounded by overgrown vines, 
and trees in the connecting yards. Behind the fence and directly behind my house was a vacant lot, and on the other side of that woods that stretched all the way down to Washington County. So, in essence, nothing. If anything were to happen, it would have probably been traveling for miles, I thought to myself. By the time it gets here from Washington, it's just going to want to take a nap. I plopped down on the sofa in my living room, mouth half ajar as I prepared to slumber off for the night and the weekend to come. The TV turned on as I flipped the remote and turned to one of the local news channels. I had caught the story just in time as the anchor feverishly scoured through the teleprompter. Reports have been sporadic and sketchy from various residents in the area, but one eyewitness had this to say. I gulped, thinking back to the feeling of being watched in the parking lot as a man in a John Deere hat with a beer belly and wife beater took frame in the camera. He began to speak to the off-screen reporter, saying, All's I know is it was big. It had these sharp white teeth and when it saw you it would hiss like a rapid wild animal. But it walked upright, you know, like it was a man. But it definitely ain't no man. It was furry, almost like it had a full coat of a beer or a black beer. But it definitely ain't no beer. I got my shotgun from the porch, but when I came back yonder, thing done up and had split. The reporter interjected, Did you hear it growl or snort or anything? Yes, my suppose I did. It was hissing, but it ain't like no hiss I ain't never hear, you know. It showed dem pearly sharp teeth done split up and vanish into thin air. The uneducated response was kind of humorous, but I wasn't really in a laughing mood at this point. How did you know it was out here? Obviously a pre-canned question by the reporter as it rolled off the tongue perfectly in the next breath. You see, that's the weird thing. I'm not sure what it was you call it some sort of sixth sense or something, but I just felt like there was something out there. I told my wife, hey wait, there's something out down yonder in the yard. My heart dropped and I changed the channel immediately. Shivers ran up and down my spine as I knew, just knew, that I had been an experiencer of whatever this was. I debated calling into the news story and sharing my experience, but didn't want to even bother. This had been the stuff they wrote about in those kooky UFO books, or the weird Bigfoot books. Someone had just felt it. And if that didn't discredit me, I don't know what would. I'd be 58, trying to sell a copy of a book of the day I got spooked, desperately giving cryptozoological talks at conferences of weirdos and crazy people alike. I dropped that real quick and decided it was time for a movie. I flipped through the Netflix selections, still unimpressed at the streaming service. Nothing new, nothing good. Just the same old TV show selections, mostly from the 80s and 90s, and C-grade movies. Snap! I jumped up from my sofa, immediately clutching my Galaxy S5 and activating the flashlight switch. It was about 8 p.m. when the twig snapped out my dining room window which I had opened to let the cool breeze in. A sense of dread and fear overwashed me. I should have called the damn news station and had them send a crew out. I could have got them on camera. I could have been the hero who killed whatever this thing was. Footsteps, one heavy, one softer, one heavy, one softer. They stop. I slowly crept towards the window, keeping low, almost like you do in one of those Call of Duty video games, so as not to make any noise in my house and tip off my position. This was it, I thought to myself. I was going to do something heroic finally. I was going to be a part of something extraordinary. The footsteps started again, this time receding back towards the fence, but again they stopped only after a few steps. I heard this hiss, the man had described earlier, as I slowly crept up to the window. There was a switch to the spotlight to my backyard, just between the door to the patio and my window. I quickly lunged for it, not wasting a second, and light flooded the backyard. I gasped in horror as my face squared with the window. Staring straight at me were two sickly yellow eyes with black pupils and no iris I could see. The thing was walking upright, but it was covered in a silky brown fur. It was looking straight at me. Obviously the light was flooding it so it couldn't see too well onto my patio. I doubt it saw me. I doubt it saw me at all. It quickly hopped over the fence, and I heard the footsteps, both now heavy padding into the darkness. I sat by my window for the remainder of the night with the light on. 
I had nothing but a kitchen knife and baseball bat at my disposal, but it never came back. The sun rose, and I ventured outside to investigate the footprints. Nothing. There was nothing even out here. I walked back inside and turned on the news to get an update. Nothing. No follow-up. I checked the websites. No reports. Not even a recap. Wait, what? Had this actually happened? Was this real? When was the last time I slept? I couldn't even recall anymore. I swear, there had been something out there. That's where I ended it. Now it's been a long time since this happened, but since then I swear every night I hear something walking around my backyard. But every time I go to look, there is nothing there. It's been happening more frequently almost as if it's getting ready for something. I'm still suffering from insomnia, and I can't help but get the feeling now that we're approaching an important event. An important event in my life that is going to define who I am for the remainder of it. I just wish I knew what it was. It's simple. You get a phone call, the person on the other end of the line tells you what to do, you do it, no questions asked, and you're rewarded. With what? Money, women, gold, whatever it is you want, so long as you do what you're told and when to do it. It's not rocket science, it's nothing the normal person couldn't do. Depending on the task you choose, your reward is even more intense than the last. What could be more wonderful? What's the catch, you ask? Some of the things you're asked to do isn't exactly legal. It was a normal day in my life, the day I found this magical hotbed of wealth, sex, and drugs. Like every other day, I settled myself into work, cooking for a bitch of a boss that didn't seem to give two licks for anyone but himself, as he stalked about the kitchen, as if he was a shark hunting for prey. His ragged breathing hot on my neck as my knife diced cleanly through a tomato, the rush of excitement I felt as the soft flesh peeled away to show the red juicy insides, kept the annoyance if the boss off my mind as his eyes popped out of his head. Slice up and down, he snapped at me as if I wasn't doing that anyways. I swallowed the scarecasm that burned into my throat, giving a curt nod to the angry giant who turned on his heels before bounding away in an almost ape-like fashion. I returned to my chopping as I prepped food for the dinner rush that was promised to fall upon the five-star restaurant I currently worked in. Heat sweltering in the depths of my outfit as I moved skillfully through the kitchen to grab more of the supplies I needed. Excitement, dancing through my bloodstream as I spotted the meat I would soon butcher for the night. My skills consisted of cutting anything and everything with joy, passion, even courage as I took down live fish or chickens. The farm-to-plate restaurant was a perfect place for me, but something was missing in my life. Yeah, I got paid at least 500, I paused. What did you have to do? My eyes trailed from the meat in hand to the other preps, only a few arm's lengths away from me. I could feel cold blood dripping down my gloves fingers, dropping onto my boots as they spoke. I just had to drive these people to an old house and leave. They handed me an envelope of cash before I left. I watched as he pulled out a crumpled up piece of snow white paper from the pocket of his jacket, eyes darting to the other prep before falling back to the man with the envelope. The two were cleaning their station as it was almost time for dinner shift to arrive. How'd you do it? One asked, just went on this website. The man pulled out another slip of paper, placing it down gracefully to the cutting board below. It almost seemed to glow like a heavenly entity in the lights above, a shinning beacon of hope and joy. The rest of their conversation was drowned out as I dissociated for a few rapid heartbeats. I sat in a trace, staring, for what felt like hour but could have only been a few minutes. Charlie. The world started to turn again, as if everything was paused and someone suddenly hit the play button. Charlie. The angry voice cut me from my thoughts as my head swiveled towards the angry man before me. My boss's body covered the door behind him, his head almost hitting the doorframe. Whoa, what? I said, are you going to cut that meat or let it soak the floor? Dark brown eyes staring darkly into my blue ones before I snapped my attention to the bloody pool that stained my once new boots. I... 
Get a cut and get out of here, he shouted, turning towards one of the prep cooks who had just been chatting. One of you's clean this shit up. I ain't paying you to slack off. You have five minutes till it's time to pack up and scram. Neither of the two men questioned him. I watched as they darted towards the supplies closet together. I waited till their shoes vanished from sight before scrambling to the table they'd been working at. Dropping my bloody meat in their cutting board with a sly grin, I chopped it up rapidly, waiting for my boss to leave. With a huff, I felt the man's presence diminish. Before my chopping slowed, I glanced at the envelope that was left on the table before me, nudging the envelope with a finger, no money. Frowning, I turned to the paper. It was crisp, a soft yellow color. It looked old, but felt new. My fingers danced against the top of it to smooth out the crinkled lines. Want cash? Cars? Boats? Or whores? Just follow the instructions and anything you desire can be yours. The shouting of my boss followed by the noise of scrambling feet caught my attention. Quickly I grabbed the paper, stuffing it into my pocket before pushing the bloody cuts of steak into its appropriate Tupperware. Moving quickly I darted back to my station, brushed down my tabletop, dropping my dirty dishes in the sink, and whipping off the last bits of tomato from my cutting board. With that, I made my way to the clock-out table, grinning back at the two men who stared angrily at the blood mess I left on their tables and floor, before heading towards the parking lot. Upon returning to my apartment, I settled into the false light of my lamp, pushing the dirt, papers, and tissues from my desk. Everything collided to the floor with a sharp clatter, my hands sweating as I drove them into the depths of my jacket. The paper was a bit more crumpled then, before as I attempted to flee my place of work, before being forced to return my treasure to the hands of those who wouldn't use it in the correct manner. Anything I wanted, for doing something as stupid as being a bootleg taxi service, this would be a piece of cake, honestly. I sneeze it a few times, glaring at the dog for covering my stuff. I was allergic to fur, yet my roommate continued to allow her beast of a dog to trample into my room, chew my stuff, slobber on everything before I returned from work. The soft hiss of rain pounded lightly against the glass window of my room as I glanced over the front of the page yet again. The title image was enticing. I could almost feel myself salivating at the thought of all that could become true. Did I really believe that I could have anything? Of course not. Did I really believe that idiot at work got all that money? Of course not. But the idea he might have was too much for me to pass. I glanced around my crummy room, the paint peeling, the ceiling falling apart, a view of the parking lot where crack whores hung out. This place was a dumpster can in the middle of Garbage Island, and I needed out. I dreamed of owning my own restaurant, having a big home, a fancy car, a girlfriend, or boyfriend. I'm not picky. To get stared, please download one of the web browsers below. I blinked a few times. I remember these. I used to download these things to go on the deep web as a teenager. Of course, as a teenager, I got spooked by the smallest things and never dropped farther than a few feet of the murky waters in the shark-infested internet. Pulling my small laptop to a sitting position, I got started. My memory serves me well as it only took me an hour to download and access exactly where I needed to go. Picking up the paper, it had a very specific set of click here to go here, type this here to do this, watch this to be added to this. It was a bit longer and confusing at times, but I pride myself on how smart I was, how skilled with the internet I was. Finally, I came to a page. It took a few heartbeats to load. The front looked almost like Craigslist, but instead of the usual buy-sell-trade mentality, it had different lists. Money, women, specific expenses, special requests. A few more as well. Under these was prices, hours, names of top brands like Apple, Disney, Sony, whatever else you could possibly want. I went to click on the money slot only to have a chat box jump up. Hello? I hesitated. The name was just admin. Hello? Before we get started, I'm going to need some information. He sent me what looked like a job application. It asked for social, date of birth, what my current and old jobs were, skills, driver's license, as well as some other personal information. Was this a scam? I clicked out of the chat windows, clicking on the lower paying amount, which was 100. 
It took a few seconds to load, and what jumped up looked just like Craigslist yet again. Ads were covering the page. I need a ride to this location. I need someone to drink this. Who wants to suck a dick? And more followed. All these things were easy. I'd drink someone's piss for 100, why not? Clicking out, I explored the other numbers up to a thousand. Some were a little sketchy, from doing nasty pranks, stealing, robbing, raping, and even kidnapping. Yet I found myself not caring in the slightest. None seemed that terrible to me at the time. I know, I'm awful, but I need money. I laughed at some of the stupid ones. Help me kill a vampire. Snapchat Mothman. I want to fuck a demon. Those would be easy money. I didn't believe in that nonsense anyways. I figured I'd take on a few easy ones and be set. I pulled the chat window back up. It took me another hour to fill out their forms. After I filled out one, I was sent another and another. After that, I made a nickname for the site before being informed I was going to be reviewed and would be contacted via my cell phone. He had me pick and choose some of the tasks I was interested in, and with that I logged off. Giddy like a child on Christmas, I could hardly sleep that night, devoting most of it to sneezing, and laying in bed overjoyed at the idea of leaving this shithole soon. Sleep fell upon me late that night. I settled into an uncomfortable yet excitable snooze. A week passes. I was a little broken-hearted as I heard nothing. I decided to check the website again to see if an admin would be online, but when I tried to reach the site, it wouldn't allow me. Depression started to take over. Panic, I gave them all I had. My bank account information. My social ID. How would I explain this to the cops? Finally, on my day off, I was sent a text. I scrambled from the warmth of my covers, blood roaring in my ears as I looked over the text from an unknown number. Hello, Charlie. You have been accepted by the admins. You will receive a phone call within the next hour. Good luck. Good luck? It was like clockwork as the phone rang only seconds later. My heart leapt as I put the phone to my ear. A ragged voice purred at the other end. Hello, Scrooge. I grinned at the nickname. I'd like to hire you. I was hired that day to follow someone. I met with a very average looking man. He handed me a camera, tape recorder, and half of $500. With that, I was off. The man tipped his hat at me. He was older wearing formal with a cane. He looked like someone's grandfather, but I didn't question this as I got to work. It was a long day. I was informed to spy on a male. He was short, maybe 5'3", long shaggy hair, shaggy beard, wearing lazy looking pants and a t-shirt. He looked like any other normal guy, but I didn't question this. I followed him, took pictures, voice recordings, the works. He didn't seem to notice me. I felt rush of adrenaline I'd never felt before. And as the time came to a close, I felt the desire for more. I got paid that night, returned home, and waited. I had three days off. I could do anything. I sat in my chair, logged on, was overjoyed to find the page was up yet again. I didn't think twice about it as I started to pick out jobs. The next three days went by in a blur. I did job, after job, after job. I'd pick a job. Either they'd approve me, or reject me before giving me a different job to do. I stayed in the 500 and below range. I stole some stuff, broke into a few homes, made some rather unsavory phone calls. I had already made my paycheck two times over by the end of the three days. Upon returning to work, I felt like I was on top of the world. No man was like me. I had so many skills I could do anything. I learned so much just by doing petty crime. It was such a thrill I almost couldn't hold back my frustration with work. As I started to clean up for the end of the day, my boss stormed up to me, his bulky frame looming over me. His eyes wide with anger, he opened his jaw to speak, but before his words could tumble out, I spoke out. I'm putting in my two weeks. I sneered. The anger on his face melted, brows narrowed in confusion as I puffed out my chest to speak. I found a better job that pays me what I deserve. I informed the male before me. So, Ricky, I continued. I'm heading home. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe. I tossed down my dish towel, stuck my nose in the air before stomping out. What a rush. I hadn't felt that big since I punched Randy Gorman in high school. I entered my home as if I was the king of the world. My smile wide, my chin up. Maybe I wouldn't go into work tomorrow. 
What would they do, fire me? I didn't need them anyways. With the way I was making money, I would be living the big time soon. I decided work was shit. I didn't need to work for those assholes anymore. Ricky would live without my help. He gave the chef promotion to someone else anyways. I went full time doing my Craigslist jobs. I still stayed in the lighter range of things, but the more I did, the more I felt the tug to do more, harder things, evil things. One night I decided to do it. I took on a thousand dollar prize, something I'd been hesitant about. I had to kidnap a baby. What for you ask, who cares? They could have used this small child as a paperweight, and I wouldn't care one way or another. I did what I always did. Met a lady in a coffee shop. She tried to tell me some stupid bullshit about it being her rightful baby or something. Who cares, really? Boring details. She handed me half of what I was supposed to get. She got up and left. I sipped my coffee, glancing in the bag she handed me. A Walmart bag with a single envelope nestled in the bottom. My smile faded when a noise caught my attention. Someone grabbed the chair across from me, yanking it out causing the metal frame to make a loud, angry scream. Slowly I raised my head. My heart stopped. Standing before me was a large muscle-bound man with a wicked smile formed over his usually frowning face. Ricky. His hair had recently been cut down. His normally dark eyes seemed to have a new light to them as he took a seat. I swore I heard the chair heave in agony under the weight of his large muscle-built frame. So, Scrooge. My heart stopped. You're the one who's been piling on the work loud recently, huh? My mouth was dry. Nothing seemed to want to come out as I opened my jaw to speak. Yet silence continued to fill the air. What was I supposed to say? How did he know? Yeep, yeep, yes, I squeaked out. Did I really fuck myself over this bad? Was he sent to kill me? I shook silently as I took a quick swig of my warm drink, looking around to prevent myself from looking him in the eye. That's when my eyes fell upon a familiar face, the man I stalked. He was sitting in a chair not too far away. His eyes in a book, narrowed. I have a personal job for you. My eyes snapped back to the man before me. His grin was thin, wide. He almost reminded me like a snake. I almost expected a thin tongue to come out and lick the air around me. A job? I replied dumbly. Of course, I was the best after all. Wait, did that mean? Yes, a job. You'll be getting 20,000 big ones. The world stopped. Did I hear him right? My eyes grew to the size of moons. My jaw almost hit the floor. He looked around us as if making sure no one was within earshot. I glanced around as well, paranoid now only to notice the man from before was gone. Blinking a few times where he sat, I returned my sharp gaze back to Ricky. What's the job? I manager to spit out, taking another drink of my latte. I see the way you use that knife of yours, Charlie, he whispered, getting close enough to my face that his lips nearly touched my nose. I felt shivers racing through my body as dread ran up and down my spine like someone ran ice claws across my back. Would I be key? I couldn't say it was someone's life worth all that money. Yes and no, we just need you to make a very specific cut, he replied smoothly, sitting back. The male pulled a folder from his bag, pushing the manila paper towards me. As if my hands were made of lead, I slowly reached for it. Ricky moved like lightning. He grabbed my hand, yanking me towards him so my face was only inches from his. If you accept this offer and mess up in any way, he whispered. Your face is going to be in my next folder. I yanked my hand away in terror, glancing down at the yellow folder sitting in the table before me. Eyes wide with curiosity, I was the best, right? I could cut someone for that much money. Yet, the way Ricky was talking, I didn't hesitate anymore as I grabbed the folder quickly, opening it with excitement popping through my veins. The first thing I saw was a picture of the man I stalked. It was the same picture I took. His amber eyes narrowed, his long hair running down his back, something about the way his eyes looked. It was almost as if he was looking at the cam. Well? Hang on, who do you think I am? I went to cooking college, not Oxford. I need time to read. Skipping over the picture, I read what was written. For you, sir, Scrooge name Gunner. Gunner is to be kidnapped, taken to the location on the map. 
He is to have his tattoo on his calf cut off, not full leg, just tattoo, with knife provided as asked by the payer. You are then to leave, give the tattoo to the payer and go home. If this is accepted, you will be asked to take a week off. I glanced up at Ricky who was sitting back in his chair, eyebrow raised. Are you the payer? No, I'm an admin. I had a few questions, but before any of them left my mouth, he pulled the paper from my hands, holding it up as if to taunt me with it. If you do this, you will be working with me and two others. You will be given all the money at the end. This is a big job. This man will not come out alive, but you will not be part of the main killing. He pulled a picture from his pocket, holding it up for me to see. I narrowed my eyes at the picture. The picture was of Gunner's tattoo. It was the skull of an animal, an animal with what seemed to be antlers, probably a male deer, judging from the name I assumed him to be a type of hunter. So he was gonna die, but I wasn't the one who was doing it. I remembered the joy I felt for cutting open meat, the beautiful red. I glanced down at my shoes that still had red stained on them before looking back up at Ricky. I'll do it, the man smiled, handed me the papers. We're going to pick you up tomorrow at 5 a.m. With that, he turned and left. The night went as planned. I broke into the home, super easy, and took the small baby right from its bed. I took the screaming infant to its mother. Who cares? It wasn't as hard as I assumed it to bed as I drove home to get ready for tomorrow. As I got into my room, I noticed a package on the bed. I slowly lifted it up and noticed it had Scrooge the duck doodled over the front, causing me to give a dry laugh. The inside of the box had a few more scraps of paper, giving the exact place I would go after the crime is done, what to do after, how to wash off blood, and how to take care of the skin. The box also held a piece of Tupperware from the very place I had just quit, from not long ago, as well as a knife that was generally made for thin, perfect cuts. It was real. This was happening. I was going to help murder someone. I know I was excited before, but this was far greater than anything else I could possibly explain. It was as if my body was filled with lightning. Sleeping was impossible. I stayed up for hours looking over the picture of Gunner's tattoo, carving it out in whatever I could find to practice. My heart was beating so fast I swore the entire apartment complex could hear it as I continued with my work. The time ticked by slowly I finally slept. Heavy, happy sleep. I dreamed of stabbing Gunner, his blood rushing out, covering the floor lapping hungrily at the legs of my pants, spewing out, the room filling with crimson. I could almost taste the blood. It was so sweet. My alarm went off. It was 4 a.m. I got to my feet, got dressed in throwaway clothes, got a bag together and waited. A large car pulled up. An all-white van had its windows tinted as well as a license plate for out of state. I was growing more giddy with every second as I scrambled for the door, throwing open the passenger seat and settling it. This was it. I was about to help kill a man. I was going to help kill a man. For a heartbeat, I froze. Was it worth it? Maybe this guy had kids or something? Wait. No, I hate kids. Who cares? I'll kill his kids too. Are you ready? Ricky asked, glancing down at me. The grunts of a few men behind me spooked me. I looked back to see two men almost the same size as Ricky. I felt no fear surrounded by these large men. After all, Gunner was small. How much damage could he possibly do? I nodded, sitting back in my seat as the car started forward. We drove for about 15 minutes before pulling up to a small park. It was well lit. The full moon glowed above casting cold light against the grasses below. A small playground settled in the center of a sea of grass. Beside this was a path with lights hanging down around it to keep it bright. Every morning he comes running, every night too. I chimmed, reading the man's information on a slip of paper I found in my folder. I remember taking his night run pictures, more like dusk than night. I was excited. You could hear it in my voice, see it in my eyes. The men all got out of the car, leaving me to my studies. In a sick manner, I wanted to know everything about this guy I could. Sadly, much wasn't on here. Job, unknown. Family, unknown. Friends, none. So on and so forth, it was as if this guy wasn't even real. There were pictures I took of him chatting with a few people, 
He gave away soup at a kitchen, was seen paying for someone's groceries, talking to other people, snorting at the good two-shoes bullshit. I turned a page to see a small section, girlfriend, Sawyer, black dark hair, blue eyes. I just had a small picture of them together next to the writing. She was pretty. Maybe that's who won him killed, the bastard probably cheated. I scoffed. Time went by. The moon was slowly starting to die behind the trees. The stars danced. Where were they? It had been a good 20 minutes. The sun would be up soon, and so would other people. I glanced around looking for any homes, but the park was rather secluded. It was then that I felt something smack against the car. Scrambling to the window, I looked outside. Ricky was making his way to the door. I moved myself back into my seat as the driver's side swing opened. The large man settled back in his spot, tossing a gun into my lap. Glove box, he snarled. Only seconds ticked by when the back door was opened. One man climbed in. The gunner was shoved next to him before the last man sat down. I sneezed a few times, causing Ricky to grunt in irritation. Saw the gun, tail went right between his legs. Fucking coward. Ricky laughed. I glanced back at Gunner. His face was covered, hands tied, feet tied. He didn't move as we started the car. It jumped to life and stared to cruise forward. I raced my fingers through my shaggy blonde hair as we started our journey. The mini tees ticked by. The sun cast dapple light against the clouds, but it was swallowed whole by the threat of a storm. Rain ticked against the window an hour and a half later, till finally we pulled into a forest. The trees were dense, large, a two-hour drive, and finally we were getting close. The entire drive I had completely forgotten my hate for Ricky, laughing, joking, and even smoking with the three. You can have whatever drugs you'd like after you make your cut, Ricky mused. My treat. Excitement was bubbling up in my chest as a small home showed before me. It seemed like something you'd see out of a horror movie. One should be worried a bad gust of wind might just knock it down. Holes littered the roof, and in the drive, way was a small Chevy Cavalier. That's your getaway car. One of the men informed me from the back as they opened he doors, roughly tugging Gunner out of the car. He let out a grunt, falling to his knees before being hoisted up. I stepped out as well, sneezing a few times as I did so. I glanced at Gunner as they dragged him towards the front door of the house. I had almost forgot he was in the car. He had been completely silent. Not a word, didn't try to move or escape. Something about the man made me shiver. He acted as if this was just something be expected. The house loomed over us, its old windows angry. It smelled of dust and mold, letting out a loud groan as the door was pushed open and Gunner pushed inside. The inside was covered in dust. The floors were carpet covered in dust. The insides were empty, gutted out years ago by whomever owned this home. Now all that was left was an old couch dead in the middle of the place, as well as a small little table with a few knickknacks set on too. Gunner was pushed into the couch and when his body hit the pillows of the cushions, dust exploded everywhere. I sneezed a few times as the dust covers the room. Allergies? One of the men laughed, opening the door to a basement. Only to fur. Not dust, I mused. Must be a cat around here. We need to set up and get ready. You stay here and watch him, Ricky stated as the three made their way down the set of stairs, each step screaming under the weight of the men. They're so big the wood's probably gonna break, am I right? I nudged Gunner's arm with my fist. Don't look so glum. I sat across from him, sniffling, as another sneeze took over. You get to go to heaven. I'm sure you're religious. I saw you giving stupid people money. Gunner's eyes glanced up at me. Anger was fuming in their depths as if they were made of fire. You mean the homeless people? He growled. Yeah, whatever those fuckers. You know they sit in front of my apartment and eat up all the space. He didn't reply to me. The anger in his eyes just seemed to grow. I felt awkward as I tried to think of something to say. What was I supposed to say to someone I was about to help kill? Nice weather recently, I fumbled. It'll be real nice tomorrow, too bad you won't be seeing it. No answer. So, blue eyes, she your girlfriend? I opened my folder, pulling out a picture of the girl. She's hot. Maybe I'll make her mine after this. I heard the venom in my own voice. If not, I might not give her a chance. 
It felt wonderful to talk like this, to have so much power. He couldn't say a thing to stop me either, but his reaction wasn't what I expected. He laughed. His laugh seemed to echo against the broken walls of the home. She's scarier than me, he whispered. I bit my lip. What did that mean? I got up, deciding to explore to pass the time. I checked my phone, no signal. I checked around the empty room, but all I found were the car keys for my getaway vehicle. I pocketed them. Turning back to Gunner, who was staring out the window, the rain lightly padding onto the ground below. A few drops of water fell from the broken ceiling. Before I could say anything, Ricky walked up the steps. We are ready. With that, the men came back. They started to herd Gunner down the steps, shoving him harshly with each step. He let out a small hiss of pain as I bound down after the group with a jump in my step. As my feet hit the floor, dust kicked up around us. I watched one of the men ruffle Gunner's long hair as he was forced down into a chair in the dead center of the room. I sneezed a few times as my eyes adjusted to the darkness that collected around us. The only light was from a dim bulb on the ceiling. The sound of shuffling could be heard before a sharp, bright light flickered on. I glanced down to the floor as the brightness burned into the depths of my eyes. My boots were covered in dust. The blood still settled on the top of my boot from what felt like ages ago. That's when I froze. I could see shoe prints in the dust from all of us. I followed the prints from the stairs to Gunner's chair. One of the prints wasn't human, it looked like the prints of an animal. I immediately noticed one of the male's shoes had fallen off in his scuffle a few hours back. But why would there be a... Hello everyone. Snapping my neck towards the voice I looked on in shock, in front of Gunner was a large spotlight that shone light directly on him, a few monitors and a video camera. Ricky was wearing a pig mask, laughing as he introduced himself to the world. This was it. It was one of those live stream murders. I heard of these things happening in the deep web, but I never thought I'd be a part of one. I forgot about the paw print as excitement rang through me like a bell. Ricky tugged a small table from the darkness. On the table were tools of all sort. I could see messages popping up on the screen. Put an ice pick in his knee, one typed. Drill through his rib cage. Another wrote, scalp him. One roared. Now, now we will get to all that. Ricky laughed. First we have a special guest. I felt a nudge. I turned towards one of the men who was holding a duck mask out to me. I felt my heart flutter. I gladly took the plastic mask. I placed it over my face before digging through my bag. I pulled out Gunner's file and the knife, letting out a gasp of surprise as the file slipped. A few pictures fell out of the chocolate-haired male going about his life. My heart tugged. For a second I frozen, dissociating as I tried to figure out if I really wanted this but the money. I looked to Ricky whose hand was out to present me. I felt another nudge as I gripped the knife and made towards the camera. Scrooge everyone, Ricky laughed. He's going to be cutting off a very special tattoo before we get stared. Ricky made towards Gunner who was looking dead in the camera, the same fire in his eyes as before. The large man took a pair of scissors off the table, cutting open the other's jeans to show off the large tattoo on his calf. The world started to go quiet in my ear as I made towards the other's leg. Completely focused, I didn't even hear anything Ricky was saying or doing. It was as if the world was underwater. I slowly placed the tip of the knife against the skin. I shook, everything in slow motion. I looked up at Gunner, who glanced down at me. His eyes flashed. Was it fear? No. It was something I could identify. You'll regret this, he whispered. I can smell you from miles away next time. Don't spill any blood. I stared at him. What did that mean? What felt like hours was only a few heartbeats before I heard Ricky shout my username. I plunged the knife down. The sick noise that followed sent a shiver up my body. The groan of agony from the man in the chair caused me to break whatever spell was held on me. I slowly started to move the knife around the tattoo. The skin let out soft pops as the knife moved against its soft surface. Crimson dripped from the large cut in his leg to the ground below splashing into my boots in the same manner as the meat from work. A giddy laugh broke from my lips, sharp metal gliding through the flesh like butter. 
The blood was covering his leg. My hands, I couldn't believe it as I closed the circle around his tattoo. He let out a few deep groans as I started to cut the layer off. I froze. Under the bloody skin was something else. I pulled the knife back, running the tip over the dark hair. I sneezed. Why'd you stop? A voice asked. I looked back up at Ricky, dumbfounded before starting my cutting again. But this time, no noise came from Gunner as the large flap of skin fell to the ground. I glanced at the opening in the skin only to scream. I jumped back in confusion and horror. Ricky scrambled back to prevent me from bowling into him. I told you, Gunner growled. He had been glancing down at me while I worked, and now he looked up slowly to me and the other men. His once amber eyes were now a bright yellow. His face was starting to twist. His teeth clattered to the floor as the skin on his body budged and moved, as if they were a ripple in a calm lake. His long hair started to move, swaying, covering his back. The skin split open, blood racing down his body, as the skin crackled to show off the fur under him. Panic exploded through my body, fear burning through my head, blood roaring in my ears as a small voice screamed at me to run. What are you? I hear someone yell. He's still tied down. Ricky shouted, kill him. All three men rushed Gunner who let out an inhuman, earth-shattering howl. Everyone froze in fear. It took a few seconds for me to regain my control as I got to my feet. The men seemed to return to reality as they grabbed knives, scissors, anything to kill Gunner. Fuck this, I hissed, glancing at the screen of words. Everyone seemed to stop typing at once as the large men struggled to shove anything into the hard flesh of the wolf. He's getting loose, Ricky shouted. Charlie, help us. I looked from the mess of bodies covering Gunner to the door before looking down at the large chunk of tattooed skin. My jaw fell. Charlie, Ricky shouted again. With that, the cords holding the werewolf let out a sick snap. I raced forward and snagged up the skin, blood still dripping from it, but the tattoo was clean. A deer skull in the middle was three large slashes. Just as I grabbed the large chunk of flesh, Gunner sunk his teeth into one of the men's necks. I watched in horror as the thorn-sharp teeth broke through the skin so easily it was as if the man's neck was made of nothing but jello. Gunner tore a large chunk of flesh from its host. Blood exploded from the opened wound splashing against the walls. I didn't waste any more time. I grabbed my backpack and started for the stairs. The sickening crunch of bones could be heard as my feet met the first step. Charlie! The anger in Ricky's voice was nothing compared to the fear that pumped through my veins like blood. I ran halfway to the top of the steps when a loud scream cut pierced my heart. My feet stumbled for a few steps, but I refused to look back until my hand collided with the cold metal of the doorknob. Sucking in air, I slowly turned to look at the mess below. Blood stained the floor, covered the walls. One of the men's heads had been crushed into the floor. His brain was smashed into the tarps that covered the area. The other's head was stuck in the wall, as if Gunner had tossed it into the now-broken computer monitors. Finally, I glanced to the first step, where Ricky was trying to pull himself towards me. Charlie, please, he begged, holding out his hand. Gunner, who had been breaking the rest of the computer equipment, slowly started to walk towards Ricky, whose leg were bent in odd ways being dragged behind him. Please, he begged. Gunner dug his claws into the man's legs, yanking him down from the few steps he climbed. Charlie, he shouted, tears racing down his cheeks. I shot him a smile, waved, and opened the door. Should have promoted me. The look on Ricky's face is forever burned in my skull. The look of betrayal. I slammed the door behind me. Now I had to run. Now way that damn werewolf was going to catch me. I tucked the scrap of skin into my bag, ripped off the mask, and pelted through the house at top speed. Not only was my old boss dead, but I was about to make a lot of money. I couldn't believe my luck as I tore open the front door of the home, slamming it behind me with force. The car keys jingled in my pocket as I fished for them. It only took a few heartbeats for me to find them. A howl ripped the piece of the outside apart. Rain slowly started to fall again as I scrambled to shove the key into the car door, pulling it open with rapidly. Dumbasses! I laughed. I was on top of the world again as the car roared to life, causing my body to slowly start to relax. 
It only took a few minutes for me to put the house miles behind me as I drove as fast as I physically could down the streets. No way that wolf was going to find me. I was safe. I just had to drop off the skin and I was safe. I glanced in the back mirror and in the darkness of the dying day, I could just make out a large shape. It was charging towards my car at an alarming speed. Fear flickered back into my bloodstream. I cursed under my breath as the rain slowly fell. I knew the forest was thick, long, dense. Half of me wanted to pull over and start running but I knew that he'd track me down easily. I felt hot tears burning into these sides of my eyes. I didn't want to die. I was just about to make the money for my own restaurant. Another howl, a deep, angry howl. I knew I was toast, done for, pushing daisies. I was dead. I'll never do this again. I just want my own restaurant. I was desperate. I shouted into the air, eyes wide, palms shaking, sweat racing down my brow. I didn't want to die. I promise I'll never hurt anyone again. That's when it stopped. Not the car, not my tears, but the feeling of dread. It was as if the weight was lifted from my body. I looked in the mirror. Nothing. The rain was the only sound I could hear, and soon I was out of the trees. I'm home free. I drove home, I changed, showered, put the skin in its proper place, and left. Now here I am. I'm sitting in a coffee shop, waiting for the mystery person to give me my money. I have the skin in a bag. I don't know exactly what happened tonight, or even if he was a werewolf, I just know it happened. You don't have to believe me, I don't care either way. Because I'm about to be the proud owner of a new restaurant. And the only thing I'm a little worried about while I wait? I can't stop sneezing. It's giving me some bad anxiety. But I'm hoping it's just my clothes. They're covered in dog hair. I've been waiting an hour or so. Only people in here and a barista and a lady. It's not her. The lady who's picking up the skin is said to have blonde hair, blue eyes. This lady has black hair, blue eyes. I'm going to go talk to her and see what she has to say. Maybe she just dyed her hair. She has a bag with her. She actually looks familiar. Oh well, wish me luck, everyone. I'll keep you updated if anything else happens.